Hi guys, welcome to the second in a four part series on NMR spectroscopy. So today we're going to talk about proton NMR spectroscopy and applications. So the last time we mentioned some terms, chemical shift integration, equivalent hydrogens, we're going to go into it a little bit deeper now. So NMR and chemical structure. So there are four types of information from an NMR spectra that makes it an extremely valuable technique for determining chemical structure. As we said in the previous uh, lecture, it is widely used, it's a widely used technique. So the first of four, the number of sets of peaks. This corresponds to the number of magnetically or chemically different types of protons. So that's one type of information that we get from an NMR spectra. The second valuable information we get is the chemical shift. So the key to NMR spectroscopy is that the exact energy at which this peak comes, which can be measured extremely accurately, is dependent upon the local environment of the carbon. And the third type of information that we get, integration. So we mentioned that we're going to go into it a little bit more here. The area of the peak is proportional, that's the area under the peak is proportional to the number of protons that are magnetically equivalent. And the fourth type of information is splitting. So you saw it in the last, in the video from the last lecture, we're going to go into it today. The number of peaks observed for a given proton is dependent upon the number and type of protons in the vicinity of the one that is being observed. All right, so let's talk about each of these, right? So firstly, the chemical shift. Electrons in the molecule have small magnetic fields associated with them, which tend to oppose the applied field. These magnetic fields are said to screen or shield the nuclei from the full strength of the applied field. We mentioned this. The greater the electron density, the greater this shielding will be, hence nuclei which are in the electron rich environments will undergo transition to a higher applied field than nuclei in electron poor environments. So we mentioned shielding and deshielding. Thus, the relevant field at the nucleus which determine the energy of transition now becomes um, H effective equal H applied plus H shielding. So this is kind of synony synonymous to our B effective, um, etc. that we saw in the previous lecture. And just to recall that the shielding, H shielding, is opposite in sign of H applied. All right, so the resulting shift in the H NMR, NMR carbon or uh, whether proton or carbon NMR signal for a given nuclei is referred to as the chemical shift. The, for proton, the chemical shift is given relative to the absorption of TMS, which we also met. The chemical shift in Hertz is proportional to the operating frequency and is given by this formula. The chemical shift in Hertz is equal to the frequency of uh, the proton minus the frequency of the reference compound, which is TMS. 
Chemical shifts are reported in a manner that is independent of frequency. And so we were also given this formula in the previous lecture, which is the frequency of the proton divided by the, sorry, subtracted from the um, frequency of the reference component, TMS, both in Hertz, uh, divided by the operating frequency in megahertz uh, gives us the chemical shift. So in this scale, TMS is arbitrarily assigned a value of zero. So I think we looked at one or two spectra uh, last time and we saw where that zero peak, that is TMS. So TMS is used because its protons are more highly shielded than most of the compounds that we're going to come in contact with and because it is chemically inert, so it's not going to react with our sample. So the proton NMR, uh, for the proton NMR, the Delta scale or the chemical shape generally extend from 0 to 12 ppm at 0 to 12 ppm generally, so that's generally, so it might be more. And then each um, chemically inequivalent nucleus has its own chemical shift that is independent of the operating frequency of the NMR, right? So we mentioned this already. And that is why we said that NMR is so useful because it gives us um, the different nuclei in different environments. The PPM scale is plotted uh, from zero on the right and with increasingly de-shielded nuclei, that's the increasing uh, of the chemical shift to the left. So from right to left. So from zero, to 12 for example and let me just draw that quickly so from 0 to 12 for example uh, with increasing so as we go in that way the nuclei gets more de-shielded right as we go in that direction so peaks to the left are referred to as downfield of peaks to the right since it would require a smaller applied field for them to be in resonance with a fixed excitation frequency. So these um, peaks are usually referred to as downfield. And it in the same vein, I suppose I should mention that these the peaks in this region would be upfield. So electronegative groups are de-shielding, as we mentioned, and thus protons and carbons in the vicinity of electronegative atoms are de-shielded and appear at higher chemical shifts, as we just mentioned. The more electronegative the group, the further don't feel the proton will be. Protons on oxygen or nitrogen have highly variable chemical shifts, as we mentioned, which are sensitive to concentration, solvent, and temperature, as we saw um, in the previous lecture. So I have this image here of some chemical shifts and the red, the proton of interest is in red, right? So as we mentioned with these hydrogens that are attached to um, nitrogen or oxygen, they are variable, right? So they shape, the shape is variable and the value of it, of the shift in PPM is variable right so at the end of you know this lecture or the end of the nmr section you need to have an idea of these values and how they correlate to a particular functional group so for example aldehyde hydrogen 
would um, have a chemical shift of 9 to 10. Once it's not variable like these, right? Uh, the protons, as we said, for the S on the sp2 hybridized carbons, we said are in the 5 region uh, or methoxy uh, protons, you know, in the 3 region uh etc etc right so we need to have an idea of these values and how they correlate to a particular functional group all right so here we have an example right so we have tms here which is our reference component zero and then we have our methyl right here and it's a triplet we have our methylene here at position two that is a multiplet but we look at the different multiplets in a little bit um position three here or methylene at chemical shift at 4.0 and we have a methyl here that's bonded to a carbon at uh, two point something right so what i want you to get from this slide is what we're talking about here so this methyl right that's position three that is the not methyl this methylene the ch2 that is can we say two bonds So we can say two bonds away from this electronegative oxygen is the most de-shielded at 4.0, right? And this methyl group that is the furthest, how many bonds away is it? One, two, sorry, two, and probably I should use another color here one two three i'm using the same color as all right two three and then because it's bonded so it's four so it is the furthest away from our electronegative oxygen and so it's the most shielded of our methyls, right? So this is how I want you to be thinking about uh, these types of compounds. So we, when we think about an, an, a methyl or a hydrogen that is in close proximity to an electronegative element, then we should think of it as being de-shielded when it's far away or furthest away from the electronegative atom, then we can consider it to be uh, more shielded than the others. All right, so let's introduce you to this uh, new term, anisotropic effects. So some chemical shifts are not predictable from electronegativity and hybridization effects. Sorry to burst your bubble. You probably thought it was that simple. Um, looking at only electronegativity and hybridization and, and making it um, a natural part of your arsenal for prediction of a molecule. However, we have to consider anisotropic effects. So here we have a methyl, right? So we have seen these two already in the previous lecture. So our hydrogen that's attached to a carbon, 0.9 ppm. A hydrogen that, well, that is sp3 hybridized, right? A uh, hydrogen that's attached to a carbon that is sp2 hybridized, 5, 5 ppm. So one would expect, right, in, in, the, in a similar vein, that the hydrogen that's attached to an sp hybridized uh, carbon, that perhaps it would be, you know, higher than 5 ppm. However, it's lower. It's 2.3 ppm. That hydrogen that's attached to the sp 
be hybridized carbon. So these hydrogens are acidic, both of them, and bear the least electron density. They appear at a seemingly um, anomalous position on the NMR scale, upfield and shielded. Remember what we said? Uh, up this side would be shield, sorry, deshielded and downfield. And up here, well, further up, if we're thinking of a spectrum, would be upfield and shielded. It's more upfield and shielded. So this is due to the anisotropic effect of the carbon triple bond. And what is anisotropy? Well, it is a non-uniform distribution of magnetic fields within a molecule. Sorry. All right. So here we're going to look at the anisotropic effects in three different molecules. So the pi system of alkenes alkenes aromatic compounds like this one and carbonyls which we are not seeing on this slide strongly de-shield attached protons and move them downfield to higher uh chemical shift values right so for aromatic rings alkenes and carbonyl compounds this additional magnetic field adds to the applied uh, field and for terminal alkynes, the field subtracts from the applied field. All right, so what does that mean? All right, so let's look at the, where should we start? Let's look at the alkene. All right, so basically what we're seeing here, the B naught, that is our applied, the direction of the applied field is in this direction. So B effective subtracts from the applied field above and below the pi bond, right? But in the vicinity of the hydrogens, right? Uh, the the secondary magnetic field uh, adds to the uh, applied magnetic field near the proton. So in the vicinity of the proton, it reinforces the applied magnetic field. That is for the alkenes. For the aromatic compound, this second. So what we're looking at is a secondary. Um, uh, magnetic field and how it um, impacts the protons attached to an alkene, aromatic compound, and an alkyne. So here for the aromatic compound, the secondary magnetic field also, you know, adds to the applied field near the proton. So the here in this so we have the circulating electron so in both of them we have a circulating electron right and remember what we said with the circulating electron it causes the a uh, secondary magnetic field right and what we're seeing here that for this aromatic proton it the secondary magnetic field reinforces the applied magnetic field near the proton. So we can see here that it's going in the same direction as the applied magnetic field. For our, our, for our alkynes, we're seeing something different that the, um, for the secondary magnetic field, it is going in the opposite direction in the region of the hydrogen, right? So it's going down. If we follow the arrow, it's going down while the applied magnetic field is going up. So in the vicinity of the hydrogen, it's going in the opposite 
a direction and so it would subtract from the applied magnetic field uh, and so the pi bond form a cylinder about which the electrons circulate so we have or in red here or circulating um, electrons and the secondary magnetic field as we saw in the previous slide would be uh, occurring here so we're seeing and this is the applied magnetic field so in the vicinity of the hydrogen the uh, secondary field is going in it's facing down it's coming down it, which is in the opposite direction from the applied magnetic field and so when the carbon carbon triple bond is parallel to the applied field the induced secondary magnetic field opposes the applied field in the vicinity of the hydrogens unlike uh, what we saw in our alkene and or aromatic proton in the vicinity of the proton it reinforces it's going in the same direction the secondary magnetic field and for alkene the electron this is the circulating electrons and the secondary magnetic field actually reinforces the applied for or alkene and or aromatic proton there but we're seeing some we're seeing something different for our triple bond that is parallel to the applied field so therefore as a result of that these alkyne hydrogens are shielded uh, because of this anisotropic effect and remember what we're talking about alkynes that they are triple bond and we would expect based on the trend that we we well it looked like a trend to sp3 um sp2 and we expected for or alkyne to be a little bit higher but apparently not so we have our triple bond our typical triple bond with our sp orbital sigma bond here and our two pi orbitals here that form our triple bond and we're saying that it is these hydrogens are shielded because of the anisotropic effect all right so for our carbonyls right uh, the signal for or aldehydic hydrogens appear at much lower field than uh, predictable using electronegativity and hybridization effect. So even though it's deshielded, it's still um, high, 9 ppm, it's a little bit lower than would be predicted. The aldehydic carbon is sp2 hybridized and it's trigonal so let's look at it again so when the carbonyl is oriented in the magnetic field with the plane of the trigonal carbon perpendicular to the applied field so the applied field is here the um the trigonal carbon of the um carbonyl is perpendicular to the applied field the sec the induced secondary magnetic field actually reinforces the applied field in the vicinity of the hydrogen in the in the vicinity of the aldehydic hydrogen so we have the circulating electrons here and then it causes a secondary magnetic field so in the vicinity so it's going around in the vicinity of the hydrogen it's going in the same direction as applied field and therefore it reinforces the applied field in the vicinity of the aldehydic hydrogen aldehyde, aldehydic hydrogens are therefore de-shielded by this anisotropic effect all right so let's look at benzene so 
in a similar fashion the proton so we should try to remember our numbers here so for our double bonds the shift is about five or aldehydic um, hydrogen the shift is about nine uh, for the or aromatic hydrogen here the, the chemical shift for the protons protons we're talking about is about seven six seven ppm right so here we have a similar thing so we have this imagine our benzene ring and when aromatic rings are placed in a magnetic field circulation of the pi electrons induces current rings above and below the plane of the ring as we see here the induced secondary magnetic field actually reinforces the applied field in the vicinity of the aromatic hydrogens in the plane of the ring aromatic hydrogens are therefore de-shielded so we have or circulating electrons above and below the plane we have our secondary uh, magnetic field and it's going down in the middle of the ring and then it's coming up outside of the ring and so it, the secondary magnetic field is going in the same direction as the applied magnetic field and therefore it reinforces the applied magnetic field and in the region of the hydrogens and therefore the aromatic hydrogens are de-shielded so these are some examples of the proton nmr chemical shift and i had another slide with it that we saw earlier so this is really for you to study and try to know you know where these different protons will show up so our aldehyde proton you know between 9 and 10 or carboxylic acid between 10 and 12 or aromatic hydrogen between 6 and 7 maybe 8 or um, alkene hydrogen somewhere between 4 and maybe 6 um, etc etc right so you have to actually sit and study where the different functional groups will reside all right let's look at integration one further feature of the proton nmr is the fact that the intensity of the absorbance of a given class of nuclei with a certain chemical shift is proportional to the number of protons giving rise to the signal that is the the they are under well under a given peak that is integration is directly proportional to the number of that type of proton in the molecule all right so let's do that again the area under a given peak is directly proportional to the number of that type of proton in the molecule so integrations are typically given as simplest whole number ratios Hence, for acetic acid, which is CH3COOH, will have two peaks in the proton NMR, that is one responsible for these hydrogens and one for this, one at uh, roughly two, area equal three, and a second at roughly 12, the chemical shift at 12 ppm, area one. So we have a three to one ratio in terms of the integration and three for these methyl, three methyls here and one for this, uh, meth, sorry, for this hydrogen attached to, well, a part of the hydroxyl group. So this is how it looks, right? So you would see, so the integration is here. So you'll see 1.00 that's the integration for the for the for this hydrogen here and can't even see it clearly but maybe 2.9 so roughly 3 
for the methyl on the acetic acid and I just have it different here because it's kind of hard to see so what we're seeing here for that um, OH on the um, carboxyl group that integrate integrates to one and the methyl which is three hydrogen integrates to three right so that's the area under the curve we're saying that it's three to one and it's a ratio so what we say that integrations are typically given as simplest whole number ratio and hence we have two peaks for acetic acid and we have um one that is roughly at two area equal three and the second that's roughly at 12 area equal one as we see here all right so another component tert butyl methyl ether with formula seen here will also have two peaks in the proton nmr one at roughly one area three and a second and a second at uh, delta 3.5 area one the relative areas or both peaks are the same but each one represents three hydrogens all right so this is the structure of tert butyl methyl ether right and basically we're saying that it's nine three six and three nine hydrogens responsible for this peak here and three um peaks sorry three hydrogens for this peak here so the ratio sorry so the ratio is nine to three right so again when we're doing ratio right so we can do that so roughly it is one to three all right so going back to what we said here that it's uh the integration the area on the a given peak is directly proportional to the number of that type of proton and the molecule integration sim is the simplest whole number ratio it's a ratio right so even though here we have nine protons responsible for this peak and three protons responsible for the second peak right if we do the ratio we can see that it's roughly one to three and so the area under the, the curves would be one for this one one to three i hope that is clear and just to mention you know just to get more and more familiar with the numbers here we're seeing that these methyls that are attached to uh, well, these hydrogens that are attached to a carbon that's attached to a carbon um, is roughly one point something, while this proton that's attached to a carbon that's attached to an oxygen is roughly 3.5, right? So let's just try to remember these numbers and where they occur. All right, so let's look at another example that is ethanol right so for ethanol we expect to see three different peaks we have tms right that is our reference compound and we have our methyl um that's one point something again we have our ch2 that is three point something and then we have our hydroxyl hydrogen in the 4.5 to 5 region here right and for the integration we would expect the ratio to be one to two to three right because one 
to two two hydrogens to three so we would expect um three different peaks and we would expect uh, integration of one to two to three uh, relative to the number of hydrogens. All right, so another term that we must mention is equivalence because we have been uh, using it, but not using the term equivalence, right? So for example, for this proton, for this um, molecule ethanol, basically we we have all of these hydrogens being the same in the same environment that is one peak representative of all three hydrogens here for this methylene we have one peak representing these two hydrogens here so we have been exercising this term without using the term equivalence so when protons are in the same chemical in, in environment they will have the same chemical shift so just like our methyl here we're saying all of these three hydrogens are in the same chemical environment and they will have the same shift we're saying these two hydrogens are in the same environment, chemical environment, and they will have the same shift. So in other words, they are equivalent. So we have to distinguish between homo homotopic hydrogens, enantiotopic um, hydrogens, and diastereotopic uh, hydrogens. All right, so come with me for a second. So we have a molecule here, right? And if hypothetically speaking, we have two hydrogens labeled A, H, A, and H, B. So if we replace H, A with um, something else, we use D here. Um, and if we play, replace H, B with the same thing, these structures are indistinguishable and therefore these two protons are homotopic right so they are the same they would have the same chemical shift if we have an a compound here you know we call this a prochiral center because you know it can't be chiral um so if we have a compound here, because of obviously to be chiral, this um car this point has to have four different things attached to it. At this point, it has two of the same things, two hydrogens attached to it. So let's say we replace H A with the same thing and we replace H B with the same thing. In this case, these structures are enantiomers. H A and H B are enantiotopic right so they don't form the same um they don't form the same compound they form mirror images right and so um these protons again are in the same chemical environment and have the same chemical shift so whether or not they're homotopic hydrogens or enantiotopic hydrogens they should have the same chemical shift as opposed to diastereotopic uh, hydrogens, two molecules thus created will be diastereomers to each other. Thus, in principle, the two hydrogens should have different chemical shift, right? So in this case, we have a different molecule and it already has a stereo center, right? So that point has four different things attached to it. And for the second center, which is a point of interest for us, if we replace hydrogen with an atom or a group, we get this compound. If we replace the other hydrogen with the same group, we get um, this compound. And these two compounds are not mirror images of each other. They are diastereomers. And as a result of that, we're saying that these two hydrogens would have different chemical shift shifts i should say 
right? So that diastereotopic hydrogens would have different chemical shapes. All right, so another thing that we have to mention here is spin-spin coupling or splitting. So let's consider diethyl ether. How many peaks would we expect? This is a structure, right? So we might look at it and say, okay, one, two, three, four peaks. In actuality, we actually observe two peaks. So the NMR spectrum has two sets of peaks. One has four lines of relative intensity, one, three, three, one. That's this one, one, three, three, one, which in total integrate to two protons and one set of three lines of relative intensity, one, two, one, which in total integrate to three protons, right? So the reason why we're seeing that is that we have a line of symmetry running through or oxygen and so these protons are in the same environment and these protons are in the same environment which is why you only see two peaks we have a line of symmetry running through the oxygen and so the two methylenes are in the same chemical environment the two methyls are in the same chemical environment the ratio between the two would be what four to six right and so um integrating them would um give us well the lowest combination in terms of the um the ratio between the two peaks right uh, but the point we're making here is that we expect to see, uh, well, initially prior to this, perhaps we'd have expected to see four peaks. Now we're seeing two peaks by virtue of the fact that this molecule has a line of symmetry and both of these sides would be in the same chemical environment. But the point we're making here about spin-spin coupling or splitting is that we're seeing um, one peak that has uh, relative intensity one to three to three to one and another with one to two to one so what is happening there what is happening there so in terms of integration would say one is two and one is three right in terms of what would the error under the curve that we will see for the integration but that is not spin spin coupling spin spin coupling that's what we're talking about here and spin spin coupling is why we have the splitting of the peak into four and three so this multiplicity is due to the phenomena known as spin spin coupling and arises because of interaction of among proton magnetic field mediated by bonding electrons so let's consider this molecule so it has a carbon that's bonded to a carbon a hydrogen that we label a another hydrogen that we label b and it's bonded to two other things. And this is bonded to two other things. Right? So each proton has spin a half. And there is an equal probability of this spin being aligned with or aligned against the applied magnetic field. So when you're reading that, you should have a visual... Um, idea of what's happening here if we observe ha for 50 percent of the molecules in the sample ha is aligned with the field thus the total field is high slightly higher and for these molecules the resonance will occur slightly at a slightly higher frequency for the other half of the molecules 
in the sample, HA is aligned against the field. Thus, the total field is slightly smaller. And for these molecules, the resonance will occur at a slightly lower frequency. So here we're seeing um, HA signal, right? And this is the splitting that we're talking about. So the applied magnetic field, and we're seeing half of them is um, would be slightly higher because it's aligned with the magnetic field and and then half of them would be um, aligned against the magnetic field and thus the total field is slightly smaller for these molecules the resonance will occur at a lower frequency so as a result we observe two peaks for ha whose total integrated area adds to one and we observe only two peaks for HB whose total integrated area adds to one. And I have drawn it here. So we have two peaks and each of them integrate to one. So clearly we have one hydrogen and one hydrogen. The energy difference between the two peaks for HA in Hertz is called the coupling constant. So the energy difference that's j a b here uh would be um the coupling constant in hertz there are two peaks for h a which are called a doublet so anytime you see a peak looking like this it's called a doublet when two nuclei are coupled to each other the coupling constants are identical therefore HB would also be a doublet and the energy difference in Hertz between the two peaks for HB would equal that of HA in Hertz. So JAB, that's the distance here, would be equal to JBA, that's the distance here. So we'd have two doublets and because they're coupled to each other, then the J value would be the same. All right, so the summarizing the signal splitting patterns of HNMR spectroscopy, the pattern in that, the pattern is that, sorry, N protons split the signal into N plus one peaks which is known as the n plus one rule. So let's look at some examples here. So we have a doublet here. All right, where is it? The signal. So we have these, this compound here, right? And as we saw, this is a doublet. So the, how the n, n plus one comes in is that we have one neighboring proton plus one. So N is a number of neighboring protons plus one. So in this case, we have one neighboring proton plus one that's equal to two. This gives us a doublet and we said the doublet looks like this. For HB, we have the same thing, right? So it only has one neighboring proton, right? And so one plus one equal two, we get a doublet. All right, so this is a different molecule now. For HA, right, we have two neighboring protons, so two would go where N is, plus one, that gives us three. Three is a triplet, and it looks like this, the one to two to one ratio that we saw. For HB, right, so since we consider these to be equivalent, uh, we're looking to see that what is how many neighboring hydrogens it has it has one neighboring hydrogen and so it is still a doublet so one neighboring hydrogen plus one gives us two which is a doublet and it looks like what we have seen before a different molecule now so here we have ha and we're thinking that these are equivalent and it has two neighboring uh, proton so n is equal to two plus one that's equal to three 
3 equals a triplet and a triplet looks like this. And the same is true for H, B, right? All right, so here we have another molecule and H, A. In this case, we have four, sorry, three neighboring protons, right? So we put three at N plus one is equal to four. That gives us a quartet and a quartet looks like this. One to three to three to one. And here we're thinking that all of these hydrogens are equivalent for B. So we only have one neighboring proton and therefore one plus one is equal to two and we get a doublet for B. So hopefully that is clear. All right, so spin spin coupling for one to iodoethane. So here again, we have one peak Y, at one peak at 3.2 ppm. So clearly here, we have a line of symmetry. And so we have one peak. So both the of or methylenes would be in the same environment because we have a line of symmetry. As opposed to iodoethane, right, where we don't have a symmetrical molecule, and we see where we have a quartet and a triplet. So our CH2 is a quartet, and our methyl is a triplet. So I hope that you can do that N plus one that we just went through and work that out. And as we said, this is how our quartet looks. One to three to three to one. This is how our triplet look. One to two to one. Three lines. Our quartet has four lines. And in this case, our methylene, which is closer to our Iodine, which is electronegative, uh, resonates at 3.2 ppm, and our methyl, which is uh, methyl hydrogens, which are further away from uh, the iodine, resonates at 1.5 ppm. So uh, these hydrogens are non equivalent, while these hydrogens are all equivalent. So I hope we're getting the hang of it. All right, so, oh, we didn't mention the hertz. So we could call, this This spectrum could be described as followed, right? So we have the molecular formula, C2H5I, and we have the peaks at 1.53, 3.20, we have the 3H representing the methyl, 2H representing the methylene, triplet, quartet as we saw, and the J value, which is the distance between the peaks, they would be the same because they are uh, split by the same, um, by each other. And so they have the same J value, which is seven Hertz. So that's a clue also to know that uh, one thing is beside, one group is beside another group when they have the same J value. So from proton NMR, from the proton NMR, we can determine A, what kinds of groups a molecule contains from the chemical shift and B, which groups are adjacent to which from coupling constants. So that's it. When they have the same coupling constant, that means they are beside each other. So we can also predict the number and relative areas of the lines in a multiplet as we saw. All right, so another thing that we want to mention is the splitting tree. So for this splitting tree, and where should we start from? We have this molecule here, right? So let's work with HB. So HB is this proton here. 
and this is this all of this that you're seeing here is a splitting tree all right so the largest j value is usually used first so the j a b here is 17 hertz so let's read this first peak of hb without coupling so if hb did not couple it would be a singlet at 5.65 however um peak of hb coupled to ha doublet right so coupled hb here is coupled to ha so this is a trans relationship between both protons and the j value for that coupling is 17 hertz and that's the largest value and therefore it is used first that hb uh, the peak of HB coupled to HC doublet of doublets. So here we can see HB can be split by the hydrogen uh, on the same carbon as it, but that's a smaller J value. That is, that J value is 1.4 hertz. So we end up with a doublet of doublets as it's called. So the effects of splitting are often described using a splitting tree, which depicts the original absorbance being split by a coupling constant J into N plus one peaks, right? So we can see here that N plus one in this case would be for the BA would be one plus one, two, and then for the BC, it would be one plus one, Two. All right, so let's look at HA. All right, so if HA was was not coupled, it would be at six point six one. It would be a singlet at six point six one. Uh, the largest coupling, as I said, is the trans trans trans. Oh, sorry, I didn't mention that. Oh, no. All right, so the trans trans I said would be the largest coupling and that is 17 hertz. And then you have the cis uh, coupling, which is JAC, which is 11 hertz. As we said, the largest J value is usually used first and the second splitting would be uh, JAC, which is the cis um, coupling. So in both instances, we get a doublet of doublets, but one, one peak is for HA and the other, the other doublet of doublet is for HB. So this is an example of a splitting tree where you have um, d uh, hydrogens, which are clearly not equivalent, uh, being split by neighboring hydrogens. All right, so continuing with splitting patterns, we can just to give you an idea of the shapes of the different peaks. So this is how a singlet looks. This is how a doublet looks. This is how a triplet looks. This is how a quartet looks. This is how a quintet look. And this is how a sextet look and the different ratio well the ratio of the heights of the lines in the peak so clearly this is one for singlet uh, for doublet is a one to one so both of the peaks have the same height for triplet is a one to two to one so one so the the middle um line is twice that of the ones to the end for the quartet it's one to three to three to one for the quintet is one to four to six to four to one for the sextet is one to five to ten to ten to five to one and this is the splitting pattern from the singlet to the doublet to the triplet to the quartet to the quintet and to the sextet all right, so an example of propyl acetate here. 
So here we have propyl acetate, as I said, right? So we have TMS, as we mentioned here. We have a triplet here. We have a singlet and we have another triplet, right? So looking at it, right? we should be able to have an idea of which peaks are where based on the multiplicities and the electronegativity of the, well, the position, the chemical shifts and the multiplicity. Those things should give you insight as to what is what. All right, so I think we can go ahead and say that the most de-shielded peak would be the protons attached to this carbon here and it has n plus two so two plus one three so we would expect it to be a triplet all right so again we would expect this this methyl pro these methyl protons to be a singlet because there is no neighboring protons to split it. And then uh, for these methyls, for this methyl, sorry, that is the furthest away from our electronegative oxygen, we would expect for it to be the most shielded, you know, in the point 0.9 region, and it has for n plus two it has two neighboring protons plus one it, we would expect it to be a triplet right 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 and then we would expect this to be this proton here to be a multiplet right so sometimes when we cannot figure out you know sometimes when you have overlapping peaks or you know when a peak is uh, complicated you will see multiplet and you won't see for example a quintet or a sextet right so sometimes you would see multiplet if we cannot quite figure out what it is all right so finally predict the spectrum for the following compound here so take a second and try to predict the spectrum for this compound all right if you got anything looking like this uh you are indeed correct and well not sure if you can see clearly but um when we actually are in class, we'll go through this spectrum here, right? So the we're not seeing the lines as we're used to the nice doublet, the nice singlet, the nice triplet, for example, but that's what it is, all right? So thank you so much for watching and see you next time. See you for, see you, but this is the end of part two. So we have part three and part four to go from this series.